a major country is imploding. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our lead story today, an economic meltdown is imminent as this country's slowdown is sending shockwaves around the world. And this is at a time when nobody believes the U.S. economy is going to face anything more than a mild slowdown. We just heard this from Fed Chair Jerome Powell, that the economy is still running too hot and that inflation needs to come down. And there's really no signs that a recession or anything worse could happen here. And yet what he can't see and many others can't see is the external force coming out of this one country that's literally going to send the entire world into a financial crisis. And if you're wondering what we're doing on the sky bridge of the World Financial Center in China, well, there's no better place to get a bird's eye view of the epicenter of the next crisis than from here. Let's over to Bloomberg where we picked today's story up with a headline, Evergrande shares plunge a whopping 87% in Hong Kong after trading resumes. Now, if there's ever a sign, and many people kind of miss the obvious, if you look at what the market's now telling us about these property developers in China, that they're near worthless. We're talking some of the biggest property developers in China. Their stocks are literally just getting annihilated down to next to nothing. So we're hearing from Beijing that they don't need a lot of policy support or stimulus, that they're a little worried, but they don't need much. And yet the market is speaking that these companies are outright bankrupt. And if we see China's property sector crash, which is now the base case, well, we talked about the link to the banking system, but what it means for that, well, when that goes as well, it's gonna spread contagion risk all around the world in a very rapid way. The defaulted developer postponed creditor meetings that were scheduled to be on Monday, adding to uncertainty over one of China's biggest restructurings ever, and now plans to hold them in late September, citing desire to let creditors consider, understand, and evaluate the terms of the so-called schemes and give them more time to consider recent developments, including the share trading resumption. So here's really what they're doing, because we're going to see Evergrande attempt to restructure their debt. And why are they giving people more time? Because it's simple. Look, our stock just tanked to next to zero. And you might want your money back? Well, great. Here's the terms that you're going to give us. And if you don't, well, the market's already spoken. We're about to be completely bankrupt and you're going to get wiped out. So we're going to give you a little more time. Because remember, when you think about someone who's lent out a lot of money, well, you kind of own the bank at that point. And in this case, Evergrande is calling the shots, telling everybody, look, the probabilities you're getting your money back are pretty low, so you better restructure us and hope in the meantime, Beijing steps in with some major stimulus and policy support to give you a chance. And so we're gonna give you a little extra time to consider this. And in the meantime, we're pretty sure you'll see it our way. And Evergrande has applied to resume trading after saying improved internal control system and processes met its obligations under Hong Kong listing rules. The stock last traded on March 18th, 2022. And get this, the company has now lost 99% of its market cap since its peak. Now, of course, nobody thinks any company in the U.S. is going to face such an event. But I can tell you, we know the contagion risk is going to spread across the global financial system. We know our banks are already in bad shape. The risk here are equally as high. But remember, we're not going to be where it starts this time. This time, it's going to be in China, and we know exactly now it's going to be with the property developers who are unlikely to survive. The developer reported aggregate liabilities, get this, of 2.39 trillion yuan. This is what they owe at the end of June, larger than its total assets of 1.74 trillion yuan. So you start to think about this of why they're going to their creditors and saying, look, you need a little more time. Look at the data. Look at the evidence. You're probably not getting your money back, but there's a good chance if you take our terms and a whole bunch of wonderful scenarios happen, that it actually might work out because that's kind of the belief right now. Let's just restructure everyone's loans. Let's give them longer terms, easier credit terms. Let's just make it easier and hope everything turns around. The risk, and we all know this, is what happens if the global economy doesn't actually turn around, as many say it's likely to. Well, we can see that all this restructuring isn't going to make a difference at all.
the cash shortage which we've made the case for not only is there a global dollar shortage but there's a yuan shortage as well unlikely to be eased by trading resumption and creditor vote and dangerous is housing completion and china wider housing recovery offshore bondholders now have four more weeks to digest the latest developments as they consider the company's debt restructuring proposal which will make the case they're going to take anyways because what choice do they have you know you think of this if you're a buyer of a property there in china are you going to want to buy something from evergrande because remember you've got to buy it ahead of time get a loan ahead of time and then they build it do you have any confidence that this company is going to be around to honor that probably none so what do you see the reaction then from the consumer is going to be is people will draw further from the housing market they're not going to want to buy maybe even sell and try to get out of this thing before it crashes the developers go down the banks go down and then it spreads all over the world and it's already starting to as China's five and a half percent stock rally fizzles, can you imagine that? And a blow to market rescue effort as Beijing tries to step in and get control of its market before it outright crashes. After opening five and a half percent higher on a slew of market support measures announced over the weekend, what the CSI 300 index of mainland stocks paired its advance to close just 1.2 percent higher. Foreign funds accelerated their selling throughout the day, poised to take this month's outflow to the biggest on record. Authorities even asked some mutual funds to avoid offloading equities on a net basis on Monday, again, trying to tell people, look, stop selling. And we've made this case. The problem with China is the ship is sinking. It's going down. Everyone can see it. And what does that mean? People don't want the yuan anymore. They don't want the currency. They don't want the equities. In fact, they don't want anything to do with this place and get your money out as quickly as possible. Of course, that's just going to lead to further problems. As the equity market goes down, these developers and other companies that are desperately in need of new capital, well, if their stock's tanking, they can't go to the banks and say, hey, look how good we're doing. They can't do that. They can't get capital. The whole situation just starts to get worse and worse until something actually breaks of course we know by then it's way too late for beijing to step in but they'll probably try anyways traders have been expecting more forceful support measures after recent efforts by authorities failed to arrest the market slide the announcements on sunday included a reduction in the levy charge on stock trades restriction on share sales by top stakeholders of some firms and lower deposit ratios for margin financing the china securities regulatory commission also said it will slow the pace of initial public offering so you can see here they're trying to ju juice leverage in the market by saying hey look go ahead and borrow some money buy some stocks and of course if you see a market pop five and a half percent and then drop back down and close one and a half point two percent higher do you know what you're not going to have a lot of confidence in is borrowing money and applying leverage and buying stocks what's more likely to happen is people are going to sell in a big way and this makes a lot of sense because you think about it if we're not seeing growth in an economy because there isn't enough money being generated created to expand the economy well if there's not enough money to expand the economy how does the market keep going up well it doesn't and china's stock slump has likely reached a level that policymakers can no longer turn a blind eye to as households suffer from a shrinking wealth effect from the property crisis invigorating capital markets has even become more crucial and something that shouldn't be slumping well that's your trading account if you had cta timer pro we talked about this trade on sunday the platinum trade pplt we went back and we showed you a report triggered a buy signal here we showed you how to do recovery trade with a buy here on the report that trade is net positive positive if you miss that trade and you bought here at this little red candlestick will you be up four percent in three days already because what we do is we take a look at the machine positioning we run a historical overlay this is very unique you don't see anyone else doing this and here you can see back here in july 13th the initial signal that was the first one and now you see it here on august 23rd the machine positioning they're covering off of that deep short position they're buying up and sure enough what do you see in a report a nice again four percent gain in the last three days and if you bought both of them you're now net positive and that is pretty hard to beat and you can get a subscription too there's a 14-day money-back guarantee check the link in the description below sign up give it a try and you'll see it'll change how you trade
And one thing that is changing here, we look at the consumer price index against the U.S. equities. We're kind of looking at what's going on in China because we're making the case here that the consumer price index is not just about prices and more about supply and demand. So when you see periods where demand is falling in a marked way, not just a shallow way, but a marked way, well, when you think about you know the equity market and what do U.S. investors think that we're on the cusp of a big bull market, they think because inflation's coming down that people are going to spend and that's not exactly what it means at all so what i want you to see here is that as inflation comes down and demand comes down what's going to happen we're going to see of course revenues fall profits fall and along with that equity prices fall as well and here you can see the Wilshire 5000 price index or the total U.S. stock market red against the consumer price index that's shown in blue on a year on year rate of change. And sure enough, you see consumer price index start to slow, roll over and head down. Indication demand is falling and equity prices fall. Here you can see it in the global financial crisis. Inflation just got too much for consumers. Demand started to go down and then inflation came crashing down along with demand as did stocks. You can see here 2015, what happened? Demand falls as we see the CPI equity market eventually gives back a bunch of its gains we see that here around 2019 again obviously the pandemic and now everyone thinks the opposite is going to happen they see inflation coming down they think resumption of new bull market but what they're missing is the outright obvious and now we start to look and dig deeper here we've got total compensation in the form of hourly average hourly earnings multiplied by average weekly hours of production and non-supervised employees that in blue also on a year-on-year -year rate of change like back against the Wilshire 5000 and what I want you to see is as we look at that CPI if you think back to the last chart and you think about demand coming down that's the key and why would demand come down because people's wages aren't growing as fast as they were before and in a highly inflationary environment what do you need is wages to continue to expand to give people you know the ability to spend and that leads to an increase in demand when you see the opposite happen as we see here we can note of course a wage total compensation growth slowing and even outright you know contracting at one point and what do you see the equity market come down because people just don't have as much to spend and that back feeds again into revenues and profits here now it becomes more obvious in 2015 what caused the market to go down and again you think about if people have less they're not making as much money they're not investing as much money you see that here in 2019 now it becomes more obvious and now look total compensation going down and yet everyone believes leaves the equity market is going to scream higher and yet we can then say well why is total compensation going down well it all comes back to money it all comes back to the banks if there's not enough new money being created well the economy can't expand and this chart makes it pretty crystal clear of what's even going on in china and that's why we're kind of illustrating here that when the yield curves inverted and banks tightened lending standards as you can see here in red the net percentage of domestic banks tightening lending standards for commercial industrial loans to large and mid-sized firms and you see that red line anytime it's above the black line that means financial conditions are indeed tightening they're lending less and what happens compensation growth slows and goes down into a recession you see it here again during the global financial crisis and now you're seeing it again the only difference is everyone believes the opposite is actually going to happen and what we're seeing in china is the same net effect they've got an inverted yield curve their banks have tightened lending standards i mean think about this if you're a bank in china would you want to lend into the property sector right now no way no how and yet china's industrial profits drop persists as economy weakens for the validating not only is a global economy slowing but domestically the internal chinese economy is slowing and if it continues something's going to snap as profits last month fell 6.7 percent from a year earlier according to data released by the national bureau of statistics on sunday that compared with a drop of 8.3 percent in june but for the first seven months of 2023 profits declined a whopping 15.5 percent easing from a 16.8 percent decrease the year earlier 
And China's economic recovery lost further momentum in July with growth in, growth in consumer spending, industrial output, and investment struggling across the board. Consumer and producer prices also registered the first synchronized decline. That would be deflation, my friends, since 2020. And we know, of course, when China, they export deflation, the U.S. exports inflation. So this is bad news for the rest of the world because all of a sudden prices have gone up, rents have gone up, costs have gone up labor price has gone up. And if we see deflation, well, something has to give. And usually landlords don't cut their rent. What usually then goes is, of course, the labor market as companies are forced to shed workers. But now let's take a look and see if things in the U.S. are going to have the same experience. And the answer is, you bet. And here we come back to total compensation again, average hourly earnings multiplied by average weekly hours of production and non supervisory employees. That's shown in blue on a year on year rate of change against industrial production in red. And you say, well, I kind of don't really see the correlation here. Sure, during a recession, and it would make sense, Steve, that industrial production indeed goes down. But that's why I have this second slide for you because now let's turn industrial production on a year over year rate of change. And the response, the relationship here is outright staggering. And what you can see is total compensation growth slows, then people can't afford as much. And what happens is that back feeds into industrial production, which eventually means fewer employees are needed. But look at how wonderfully tight this relationship is, suggesting that as we see total compensation growth to further decline, that industrial production in the U.S. is indeed going to slow. Of course, all that means is the yuan and eventually the dollar are going to decline in value as the offshore yuan seen tumbling to new low against the dollar in China's sell-off. And all this means, and this is very important, when we talk about fiat currencies, if you are not seeing an expansion in your economy and you're not seeing an expansion in global trade, then there is less demand for your currency and the value of it goes down. Now, the dollar gets a little bit different kind of response during crises or global recessions or things that go wrong. There is a flight to dollars. And I'll show you here in a bit that once that kind of initial move abates, well, what happens is the dollar goes down in value, too, because it's not immune to everything else. If there is less global trade, if there there's less economic growth and there's less demand for dollars. And then again, it goes down in value, not to zero as many people say, but it still goes down. And Beijing intensified efforts to halt a rout in the nation's assets in recent days as authorities urged financial institutions to buy stocks and the yuan, making it more expensive to short the offshore yuan through higher funding costs and told mutual funds, as we talked about, stop selling equities. And on Sunday, officials announced plans to cut the stamp duty on stock trades and slow the pace of initial public offerings and all the effort to get people to buy the stocks that are trading. And while the earlier efforts briefed lift, briefly lifted markets, foreign funds continue to sell at a record pace. And that means China is struggling with falling prices, a slumping property market. These are the key points. Falling prices, they're struggling with deflation. And real estate markets heavily tied to their banking sector, slumping and soaring local government debt. This is not a good scenario. And of course, no wonder their economy is facing problems. And we're going to see the same thing here. Because when you go through these big boom cycles where there's a lot of credit and a lot of debt extended, you need to keep the game going or else you risk to face the problem of you pull the reins back and next thing you know, all the leverage, all the debt, it starts to blow up and there goes your banking system. Well, that first round for us happened in March. The next round, well, probably sometime this year. And here you can see just how currencies are affected by trade. We have exports of goods and services. This is exports out of the U.S., which would imply demand for dollars against the nominal broad U.S. dollar index in red. So here you can see during the global financial crisis, there was this in, kind of instant kind of demand for safety and the dollar went up. But look what happened. You see global trade went down and then the value of the dollar fell. And you can see that here again going into the pandemic. Trade obviously went down. Demand for dollars went down. And now we're seeing it as well, even though some people are driving into the dollar, the broader trend is to the downside. And China's worsening economic slowdown is now rippling across the globe. And we've been making this case that we're in a globally synchronized economy. What happens in one major economy is going to spread like wildfire across the world. And you think about the situation, the Eurozone economy, not in good shape at all. You know, the big breadwinner, Germany, the economic powerhouse, major problems there. 
Everyone's then pointing to the U.S. Everything's going to be here okay. Look, we just had a banking crisis back in March, and we think we're okay. Not a chance because we already talked about, you know, on Saturday, things in our banks haven't got better. And when we see those loan growth start to contract, it's going to be obvious things here are really bad. And policymakers are bracing for a hit to their economies as Chinese, China's imports of everything from construction materials to electronics slide. Caterpillar says Chinese demand for machines used on building sites is worse than previously thought. Even President Joe Biden called the U.S. economic problems a ticking time bomb. What he's missing is that bomb is big and is going to affect us as well. As Asian economies are taking the biggest hits of their trade so far, along with countries in Africa, Japan reported its first drop in exports in more than two years in July after China cut back on purchases of cars and chips. Central bankers from South Korea and Thailand last week cited China's weak recovery for downgrades to their growth forecast. And it's not all doom and gloom. Well, unless you watch this show, China's slowdown will drag down global oil prices and deflation in the country, which means the price of goods being shipped around the world are falling, as that case we've been making will help bring U.S. inflation down. Here's the evidence, the U.S. Consumer Price Index and the Producer Price Index from China. Of course, what's produced in China is exported around the world and becomes our consumer products. Both are shown on a year-over-year -year rate change, and you can see very easily where producers prices go in China well it has a push downward effect on US consumer prices as we would obviously expect and that just hasn't completely fed into our CPI as of yet but get this, China's deflation isn't such a bad thing, except it actually is for the global economy. But if the rest of the world, for, for the rest of the world, the U.S. and Europe, if it falls into recession and China remains weak, then that would indeed be a problem. And that's the case we're making, not just for China, but for the whole global economy. Look, that is a risk. That's why we're here at the World Financial Center. Because again, I think this is the epicenter of the next global financial crisis. And the risk I see, it's going to spread spread around the world far faster than most can believe. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.